there is. Hello and welcome. Um, tonight is a special night. Uh, and I appreciate everyone who is joining us here in person and also um, remotely over the internet. My name is Ryan Erke. I'm the sustainability facilitator at the College of St. Scholastica. This week at the college, we have been um, having dialogues and discussion about climate change as part of the worldwide teaching for climate and justice. This is a program featuring hundreds of K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, and faith communities throughout the world who are focusing their energy and their time to have discussions about climate change and how we navigate this as a planet together collectively. As part of this program here at Scholastica today, we're um, having our special program, Anji Kamiga and um, Changing Earth. And uh, I'm gonna invite um, Professor Leah Prusha, here, our professor of social work at St. Scholastica, to help open us um, with this program. Thank you. Ujuandanoi Maganidug, Chigaming and Dayan, Mang and Dudem, Shawanangi Koyanish Nakaz, Wawate Koyan de Go. Welcome, everybody, to Anji Kamiga, Changing Earth. Um, an elder, uh, Rebecca Gaboy, and I are going to be opening up uh, with a song, a water song for you all. Um, we, we sing with Oshki Gijik singers, and I know we range from one to many, 30 plus at a time, and, and tonight we're, we're, we're two. There's two of us, and we're going to sing a water song for you. Um, I know uh, the rest of our uh, drummers uh, wish they could be here. But uh, again, health, springtime, and everything else uh, gets in the way. So we're going to open up with a song called Nibi by Doreen Day. But we're going to start it out with a different water song and follow by Doreen's song.
right. And now I get to introduce uh, Michael Wasigizig Price with my uh, hoarse voice. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me to introduce Michael. I've known Michael for uh, over a decade, and um, we're not only colleagues, but we've been friends for quite a long time. And uh, I, I have nothing but re respect for the work that he's done um, in Anishinaabe country. Uh, Michael Wasagijic Price is a traditional ecological knowledge specialist at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission in Wisconsin. He's an Anishinaabe and an enrolled member of Wakwimakong First Nations in Canada. His role as a traditional eco ecological knowledge specialist involves integrating Anishinaabe language, cultural perspectives, and ceremony into research methods and resource management to make science more culturally relevant. And I'd like to add more relevant in general, just saying. Michael received his uh, Master of Science in Forestry from the University of Montana and a Bachelor of Art in Biology from Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. He also received his Certificate of Ojibwe Language Instruction from Bemidji State University. Um, you are all here to hear some amazing words. Um, again, a beautiful intersection of his work in the Western Academy, but more importantly, our work, his work in um, Ojibwe country. I'd like to welcome up uh, Michael Wazagishik Price. Let's welcome him, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, miigwech, Leah and Rebecca, uh, for those beautiful water songs to open up uh, the ceremony. And uh, I really appreciate that from my heart. Aho, miigwech. Aho, bojo, in dinuwe ma ganadug, Michael Price wasegijik indigena kaz, makwa nindo dem. We quim kong. Dibin Dago Zian, Mi Dashoma, Wishkong Sing, and Dayan Nongo, Makwa, and Dodem. Now, I just introduced myself in our indigenous language. My name is Michael Price, Wasegijik. I, uh, I'm Bear Clan, I'm in Anishinaabe, and my family's from Wequimacong First Nations, Manitoulin Island in Ontario. And but currently today I live in Wisconsin and I work for Glyphwick, as Leah said. So thank you for that wonderful introduction as well, Leah. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> I also want to thank Brian Erke and Jennifer McMasters for putting this wonderful event together. And I also want to thank Scott. Scott, I don't know your last name, but I want to say miigwech to you for making all this happen. Now. So tonight I would like to talk about Anjikamega, Anjikamega. In the Anishinaabe language, that translate to, translates to changing earth. I got to thinking about climate change. I've been involved studying climate change for, for quite a number of years. And I know that the language of climate change involves terms like tipping points and uh, positive feedback loops and greenhouse gases. And these are all very important terms to know if, you're, if you want to understand climate change. But some of these terms require a certain depth of science to be able to understand them. So I've met a lot of elders in the community that are concerned about climate change but didn't quite know um, the questions to ask or how to talk about it. And this is what got me to thinking about finding the words in the Anishinaabe language to describe what is going on uh, with our environment, with our ecosystem, and what may potentially happen to our ecosystem as a result of climate change. And so tonight I wanted to present some of those uh, words to you uh, that I have researched and have brought forward. And many of the elders who are first generation speakers are going to recognize these words, but we're going to use them in the context of talking about climate change.
I wanted to tell you a little about myself and how I got on this path of, of integrating uh, indigenous knowledge with, with modern day science. And this goes all the way back to my teen years. Uh, uh, I used to talk to my mother about you know, who we were uh, as native people. The unfortunate thing is that my mother, my own mother, went through nine years of residential school and that many of you may know the, the history of uh, residential schools in this country uh, where they worked to obliterate the language, the culture, and the traditions in, in Native children. My mother went into that school as a nine-year-old nine child, and she came out as an 18-year-old woman. But during that process, she lost her ability to speak her language. She lost her identity as an Anishinaabe woman. And then she lost all of the knowledge that she had from her family, uh, all of her cultural knowledge about what it was to be an Anishinaabe. So when I was a young man, I, be I began to ask her about things about our, our family and our culture. And my mom was very saddened because she couldn't tell me any of those things. And so I began this journey to go to learn my culture, my language, who I was. I not only went to learn it for me, but I went to learn it for her as well because she had her language taken away from her. So when I went home, when uh, we went home to visit, and I began to ask family members about our last name. Uh, that's a little technical difficulty here. So, if you look, my last name, Michael Wasegijic Price. This is my family name coming from my grandfather's side, Wasegijic. So I began to ask uh, my family members, well, what does that name mean, Wasegijic? And of course, a lot of people said, well, Wase, Wase means bright. Like Waseya of Guaching, it is bright outside. And then they said, then some family members said, well, Gijic means sky. I'm like, oh wow, Wasegiji, bright sky. That's beautiful. That was a very beautiful name. I would talk to other family members, and they said, well, Gijik means the day, like daytime. I'm like, okay, I see the difference, or I see uh, how they're related, sky and, and daytime. And then I went to talk to my cousin, my mom's first cousin, Echo Wasegiji, and I asked him about our family name, and he told me that Gijik means cedar tree. Okay? Cedar tree. So here I am, this young, 25-year-old, college-educated man. My, my rational brain just scrambled. See, I don't see it. Sky and cedar tree. I didn't understand it. But I didn't doubt my cousin Echo because he was, he was an elder. So I just sat and carried that, that quandary for many years. That was in 1998 when I asked that question. Or I'm sorry, 1988. In 1998, I finally met an elder from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I asked this elder, who, who actually became my mentor later on, so why does Gijik mean both sky both cedar tree. I don't understand. He says, well, Michael, I have an answer to your question. Of course, I'm excited now. He says, Gijik goes back to an old creation story that we don't tell anymore. And they talked about how our ancient ancestors came down from the star world. They came from the stars and they came through a bugone Gijik, a hole in the sky. And then they climbed down a giant cedar tree, and then they populated the earth. So this term Gijik is what connects the earth to the star world. It's both the sky, and it's both this cosmic cedar tree, which brought our ancient ancestors to uh, the earth. 
So Gizek serves as this cosmological axis which aligns the four levels of the universe that we believe exist in the Anishinaabe uh, philosophy. Okay, these four levels being Aki, Earth, Gizek, Sky, Anangoka, Star World, and then Manidukang, the Spirit World. So these four levels are aligned with this one axis. And that is why the cedar tree is sacred to Anishinaabe people. We use the boughs in ceremony. We, we smudge with them. We make medicines from, from the boughs and from the, the little cones that look like berries. We build our birch bark canoes and our knocking sticks for wild rice out of cedar. Cedar is very much a part of who we are as Anishinaabe people. It's a part of our identity. And that is why the cedar tree is sacred to us. So that when now, when I go out into the forest and I see a cedar tree, I feel this immense reverence that comes over me. And I go up to the cedar tree and just touch it. And I feel the cosmology that I'd never heard before until after I'd learned these stories about Gizek and many of our teachings. So these teachings and these words can transform the way that we think if we really reflect on them and we internalize them into our, into our psyche. So that's why I wanted to start off by talking about this story. Because one thing that I realized is that these words are incredibly complex and they're incredibly beautiful. And it allows me to see the world in a totally different way. As opposed to just seeing a cedar tree, I see much more now, thanks to these stories. So that's how I kind of wanted to start off with this, uh, uh, talking about uh, these names uh, associated with climate change. <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that when we talk about climate change, we have words that actually describe uh, what is actually going on uh, in the environment. So let me introduce you to a couple of these words that I that I have uh, that I've gathered uh, uh, for our people. <clears throat> so many of you probably remember uh, last summer in July when they had all that smoke coming from the west coast and coming from Manitoba, and if you remember that that, that the air was so smoky and it, it, it actually burned your throat. And I never really had a problem breathing smoke in the past, but last summer was incredibly uh, difficult to breathe this air. And I can't imagine if people like that had uh, 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 lung conditions or, or, or asthma, they must have really struggled. So I began to search for a name for those smoky skies. And I came across this one word, Bakwene. Bakwene, which means it is smoky. Of course, Bakwene Magad. Magad is just a, uh, an intransitive uh, suffix. Doesn't change the meaning. Bakwene Magad. It means it is smoky. And this is a word that we would describe those smoky skies that, had, that, that was the result of those fires from out west and up in Manitoba. And as things begin to dry out west, this could be an everyday or an every occurrence, every summer, having to experience and tolerate these smoky skies. So that perfectly describes this, this condition that a lot of us felt. Another thing that's happening in climate change, climate change a lot of the uh, reports and studies have suggested that there's going to be intermittent drought uh, along with intermittent flooding that's going to happen uh, in, our, in our country. And when the earth begins to dry out, it, it, can no longer, it can no longer absorb water when it hits. So when, water, when land is this dry and then all of a sudden we have a flash flood, that water immediately goes across the land. It doesn't soak into the earth, okay? And that kind of flooding can cause major disruptions to not only the ecosystem, but also to the human society as well. Okay, so this is a very serious 
um, event. They predicted it in the 2007 IPCC report, um, and it's happening today. Those predictions that they made in 2007 are happening today. So the word that we call this, bate kamega, bate kamega. So bate means it is dry, kamig refers to the land or the earth. <clears throat> Excuse me, bate kamega. Okay, thank you. Miigwech. Bate kamega. Oh, that's way better. Um, describing this condition of our lands beginning to dry, this intermittent drying and flooding, which could do tremendous damage to our wild rice uh, and to our landscapes here in the Great Lakes region. Bate kamega. Another word, and we actually seen this yesterday and the day before, right here in Wisconsin and Minnesota. As you know, last week, the, it got pretty warm and then a lot of birds started returning from their wintering grounds. And as soon as they got here, as soon as they landed in their summering grounds, and all of a sudden we got hit with a winter storm. It happened just two days ago. <clears throat> And what happens here when these birds come back and then all of a sudden everything is coated in ice and the ground is covered in snow, now the birds are struggling to survive. Okay, they, they no longer have access to their food source. All of the limbs are covered in ice. Sometimes their wings are covered in ice and they begin to struggle. A lot of animals who are coming out of hibernation also too struggle because of this uh, this, this late winter storm. Now, of course, we've had late winter storms before, but as a result of climate change, this may start uh, becoming more frequent uh, in the springtime. So the Ojibwe word, the Anishinaabe word that describes this process is zasigakwi, zasigakwi. And what this term means, if you translate it literally, it means uh, barely hanging on. And if you see this picture of this uh, chickadee, uh, uh, there's no access to those, uh, th those rose hips there because they're covered in ice. Batik, or, or I'm sorry, zasigakwi, barely hanging on. But this not only applies to the birds that are struggling, this applies to anything that's struggling because of this, this disturbance in these cycles. Uh, with these late winter storms. Zasigakwi. There's a lot of people right now that, are, that were tapping the maple trees, and then all of a sudden when this winter storm came and it got down to freezing during the daytime, all of a sudden the maple trees stopped. That's another example of the Zasigakwi. All of a sudden our maple sap is no longer running. And when we've looked at forecasts for the next week, we're going to have warm days, but we're also, they're also predicting warm nights. Okay, so that's not good for the maple harvest either because in order for the sap to run well, we need warm days and we need freezing nights in order to create that pump, you know, which brings the sap up and down. Zasigakwi, barely hanging on, struggling because of these, these uh, changes in our climate. It's another picture that caught my eye of a bird just coming home or just coming back from the wintering grounds. So as the uh, report from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their 2007 report, they predicted there would be intermittent uh, drought and flooding. And this is a picture of the bad River Reservation. This is Odana, Wisconsin, and that's, you can see where the town is at, and the town is completely flooded. Uh, this is the bad river that, that is flooded out of its banks. 
And this is going to, if the predictions come true, this is uh, going to be part of our future from now on. So a word to describe it is mushka'an. Mushka'an, to be flooded. Okay? So these kind of flooding conditions is going to have a, a tremendous detrimental impact uh, if the frequency of these events began to increase. Mushka'an. Well, you can't see it. Uh, to be flooded. Okay. So at Glyphwick, we've produced this, this wonderful document. And uh, this is actually a living document. It's called the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment. We had just, uh, it was just uh, uh, printed in 2018. And in that document, we have 11 species that we have looked at. Um, um, we, we, we've used prediction models to see how these species would be impacted. We only have 11 species here, but we, when, when this project is all done, we will have 60 species that will be identified uh, that, will, that we will measure their projected climate impacts uh, to these species. So this is a document where we, have where we have combined indigenous knowledge and science. We took, the inter we took interviews from many different elders and knowledge keepers in the community, and we asked them what species to look at and, and who to analyze. Okay, we spent a long time gathering that information. And then next we turned to science, and then we looked at climate models to predict what the outcomes would be and here, in this particular report, we used a model called NatureServe Climate Change Vulnerability Index. This is a, an Excel uh, prediction model. And when we plugged in the parameters uh, uh, for all these species, it, it gave us um, what could possibly happen to these species by 2050. Now, if you think about 2050, this is 2022. We're only 28 years from, from, that, from that year. But I wanted to talk about three species that this report had talked about. Uh, and if you get the model, this report is actually free. It's online. You can get it off of the Glyphwick website. But one of the species that it talked about was our relative Oga, which is walleye. Okay, this species, according to the models that they run, was moderately to extremely vulnerable to the projected climate impacts by 2050. So what does that mean? Well, Anishinaabe people have a connection with Oga walleye. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship and tradition with this fish. So what happens if the climate begins to warm and the lakes begin to warm? The, these fish require cold water lakes, and if the lakes begin to warm, all of a sudden their habitat is diminished. The elders are very concerned about what's going to happen to Oga walleye in the future. Another species that was uh, lab labeled as moderately to extremely vulnerable is Waboos, the snowshoe hare. The snowshoe hare cannot tolerate higher uh, temperatures. It, it, it's very much of, a, of a, a northern species. But do the Anishinaabe people rely that heavily on, on waboos? Some do. But look at all of the other species in our ecosystem that rely upon waboos, namely the lynx, uh, uh, the wolf, the coyotes, um, the fishers. All of the predator species rely upon waboos for their well-being. And if waboos is threatened, that's going to also threaten the stability of our, of our wildlife and our ecosystem. So waboos is considered to be moderately or extremely vulnerable in this report. And then the last one. <clears throat> Monomen our wild rice. And in this report, wild rice is considered to be highly to extremely vulnerable 
to climate impacts by 2050. So what does that mean? What does that mean to Anishinaabe people? Well, this is part of who we are as indigenous peoples. We have a relationship with Monoman, like the Plains tribes have a relationship to the buffalo, or like the Northwest Coast people have a connection to the salmon. It's who we are, it's who we identify as. And this is part of our creation story as well. So if wild rice is going to be threatened in this region, what does that mean for, for us as Anishinaabe people? What does it mean for all the people in this region that have a connection to wild rice? Okay, so this report kind of gives us kind of a grim report. Uh, and it's within a short time frame. It's not till 2100, it's until 2050. That's not too long from now. Okay, but like I said, you can get a copy of this report uh, uh, for yourself. The Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment. So now what do we do? What is our approach to dealing with climate change and, and these possible detrimental impacts to, to our, our ecosystem and, and to our identity as Native people? What do we do? Well, I want to talk a little bit about our Anishinaabe creation story. Any creation story tells you who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. Any creation story tells a people that. And when I went back and looked at our Anishinaabe creation story, it told me a lot about science. Um, I, there are many different versions of the creation story, and I'm not going to tell the whole creation story tonight. That would take, it would take quite a few hours, probably. What I want to do, I want to glean out certain parts of the creation story that I found that was pertinent to talking about climate change. And this is a version by an elder named Basil Johnston. Uh, he's a prolific writer. He's passed on now. Uh, but he wrote an incredible book called Ojibwe Heritage. And I have followed his creation story and his writings. And consequently, Basil Johnston went to residential school with my mother. Um, they went to elementary school together. And she remembered him. And she used to talk about him. So in our Anishinaabe creation story, we talked about Gijeman Edu, the great spirit, or the loving spirit. When Gijeman Edu had this vision for uh, an earth, the first thing that happened, the first thing of creation was a ki, earth. And what this creation, this first order of creation, what it, con what it contained was the rocks, the soil, the water, the rivers, the mountains. And this was the very first order of creation uh, in our creation story. The next order of creation were the plants. And in the plants, there were the trees, the grasses, the herbs, the mosses, all of the green living things on earth. And the green living things on earth were to be dependent upon the earth. So now we call uh, the earth now the, the earth mother. The next order of creation was the animals. And in the animals, it was the four-legged, the winged ones, the birds, the swimmers, the fish, the ones that crawled, the reptiles, the amphibians, away senior, the animals. This was the third order of creation. So if we kind of look at what we have up here now, the plants are dependent upon the earth for their survival. Okay? The animal, the order of creation, the animals are now dependent upon the plants. And they're also dependent upon the earth as well. So now we're seeing this kind of this hierarchy of dependency that's, that's forming. And then the last part of creation 
was human beings. According to our creation story, we are the least of creation. And we are dependent upon all of the other levels of creation. We're dependent upon the animals for protein, for leather, uh, uh, for our, our, our teachings. Then we're dependent upon the plants, again, for food, for, for, for materials, for spirituality, for our ceremonies. And then we're also dependent upon the earth mother, okay? The land, the soil, the water. But if you look at this, this hierarchy of dependency, we depend upon all the levels of creation, but nothing depends on us. Nothing depends upon our existence here as human beings. And even if you took human beings out of this equation, all the other levels, all the other orders of creation would probably live on and would probably thrive. So this is part of our creation story. This is part of who we are as Anishinaabe people. We believe that we are the least of creation and that we were instructed to be humble and to use ceremony to be able to build our relationships with all those other orders of creation so that we could all live together. Now, if you take a look at the history of human beings, that always hasn't been so. We haven't been humble in our relationship with the earth. We've done much damage to the third order of creation, the animals. If you look back at the wolf hunt that happened back in Wisconsin in 2021, and how those wolves were, were, were just brutally treated. If you look at our treatment in the biodiversity of the planet, we, we have decreased the biodiversity of all of our forests and, and, and all of our, our, uh, you know, our ecosystems. We've done a tremendous amount of damage to the third order of creation. We've done a tremendous amount of damage to the second order of creation, the plants. You know, we, we have used poisons and pesticides to try to control the plants. We have obliterated plant species just so we could have our own comforts in, in our own civilization. And then the first order of creation, the earth itself. And we've done a tremendous amount of damage to the earth through mining, through resource extraction. Um, and I know this is something that all of you know. I don't, I don't have to to reiterate or to iterate it. Um, but again, going back to the creation story, creation stories tell us who we are, where we come from, and where we're going. And this is kind of the message I wanted to bring tonight about this, being able, if we could some way change our relationship and our perception to the natural world, and to be able to humble ourselves and be this this fourth order of creation, the one that's the least of creation but the most humble. And I believe that is the way that we're going to be able to sustain and survive, um, at least to create a world that our kids and our grandkids uh, can thrive in. So here I'm going to propose um, a framework for thinking about these things that's based on Anishinaabe teachings. And... There's four levels to this framework, and, and it just consequently, all of the English names all happen to start with the letter R. So I call it the four R's, but I'll, I'll give you the Anishinaabe names first. So the per first part of this framework is Menaji uh, Idwin. Menaji Idwin, to have respect for one another. And if you look at that word, Menaji. Uh, uh, Menage in Ojibwe means to go easy. This is not like the military definition of, of respect. This is going easy on each other and not, not making such a, a hard impact uh, on our fellow uh, beings on this earth. Menage doing. So I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, uh, let me use the wolf as an example. So we have respect for, or I have respect for the wolf. So what does that mean? To have respect, menage iduin, 
for the wolf? Well, it means that one, I recognize the wolf as being a sentient, independent being of creation, just like me, and that that being has as much right to exist as I do. So in knowing that, I go easy on the wolf and make sure the wolf uh, can survive and thrive just like I can. Menage Edwin, going easy on each other. The next step in this framework that I would consider or reflect on is um, in a Wayne de Win, in a Wayne de Win, to have a relationship. What is my relationship with these animate beings or with nature? And let me use the wolf again. What is my relationship uh, with the wolf? Well, if I think back in my culture, I know that the wolf is a teacher. You know, according to our Anishinaabe teachings, the wolf teaches us about family values. The wolf teaches us about extended family, because that's how a wolf pack, uh, that's how it's structured. The wolves also teach us about taking care of others, others' children. And that's what happens in the wolf pack as well. We take care of other people's children as well. We watch over them and we protect them. Okay? The wolf also teaches us about cooperation, about working together as a family or working together uh, as a team, and that's how they hunt. They hunt together. It isn't one wolf that goes out and brings home the food. They go out together as a team. Somebody stays back at the den and watches all the pups, and then all of a sudden they bring the food back to the family. That's what we learn from the wolf, and that is my relationship with the wolf, the wolf being my teacher. Okay, in a way, in having relationship with one another. The next level in this process, I would ask, is migi way duin, gifting one another. Migi way means means to present somebody with a gift, and ide means to each other. Okay, so this is a word for reciprocity. You give something to me, and I return give something back. So what does that mean? Let me, let's use the wolf again. What, what does the wolf reciprocate to me? Well, since I've been working at Glyphwick, I've come to learn uh, uh, something about the wolf, that wolves actually have the ability to uh, hunt and predate on the sick and the wounded. Uh, easier for them to kill the sick or the wounded Okay, and in return, that helps to create a stronger deer herd okay, by culling out the wounded and the sick. But, but also, too, and many of you maybe have heard of chronic wasting disease, CWD. This is a big thing in Wisconsin and Minnesota. CWD, there is research to suggest now that wolves can actually identify a deer or an elk with chronic wasting disease. CWD is a neurological disease that affects the deer, and when they get this, when it begins to manifest itself, the, deers, the deer become disoriented, okay? We can't see it as humans, but the wolves can. And so when the wolves identify um, a deer with possibly having CWD, then the wolves predate on that deer. And thus what happens, the wolves actually cull the deer herd of those infected with CWD. So they make the deer herd stronger. And actually the deer are, are the wolves are actually better managers of deer than humans are. Uh, and that's one thing that we talk a lot about at Glyphwick is allowing the wolves to be, to manage the deer populations and let the wolves do what they do best. Okay, reciprocity. That's what the deer do for us. They help keep the deer herd strong. What do we do for them? Well, we advocate for policy. We, adv we advocate for management to protect the wolf and to protect their ecosystem. That's what we give in return. So there's this gifting of each other. Migi way iduin. Okay. And the last one of this 
this kind of this, this, this framework, indigenous framework, is gunawenjigewin. Gunawenjigewin. It actually means to, uh, to protect um, to, to, to protect someone or to be protective. Responsibility. And the reason why I label it that is because sometimes we know that, that, that we have to do something that's right even if we're not getting anything back in return. Okay? So a lot of people will say, well, why do I want to do that? I'm not getting anything out of this. Okay, so the person who thinks I need to do this because it's right, even though I'm not going to get anything in return. To, to me, that is a higher level of existence, a higher level of executing your responsibility to the creation in which we all live in. Gunna Wayne Jigay Win, to protect, to be protective. And that's what we're doing at Glyphwick. We're always monitoring the law, the policies management policies of the state and the federal governments we're always watching okay we have a lot of meetings about the about these these things not only with the wolves but with all the species that are important to Anishinaabe people in the ceded territories okay so I wanted to introduce these four concepts to you and actually you can take these four levels and you can apply them to anything if you want to sit back and think of wild rice okay Describe the respect you have for wild rice. What is my relationship to wild rice? Okay. How does wild rice and myself reciprocate one another? And then the last one, what is my, what is my responsibility to wild rice? What should I do? So you can apply this framework to any type of species that you're concerned with. And it's really a good process to, to think about these things and to... And to um, to help grow our connection and our relationship uh, to creation. And these all come from our, our creation story. So one last thing I'd like to leave with you is that in order to build our relationship with all of these living things in the ecosystem, we have to have some type of ceremony. We have to have a type of ceremony that reinforces our relationship with the natural world. And I think that's what we have not had uh, for many, many generations. We haven't had this, this relationship that's been nurtured by ceremony. And I'm not telling everybody to go out and mimic what Native people do. You don't have to do that. Um, the things that I see that are ceremonial is one, going to Earth Day every year and being an active participant. That's a type of ceremony taking your kids or your grandkids out on that nature walk, but doing it with purpose and doing it with, with the, the, the notion that you want to educate them and to get to know the world around them, okay? That too can be ceremony as well. The one thing about ceremony is that it's repetitive. We have to do it over and over and over again until these relationships begin to manifest themselves and they, be, and they begin to be strong. Okay, so this is a real important uh, uh, part of, of, uh, of this process. When I was teaching environmental science at uh, Leech Lake Tribal College, I had a, a tobacco pouch. And I would go up and tell my students, can you change an ecosystem by giving this tobacco ceremony? By just when you go out to take something and you sprinkle tobacco down, can you change the ecosystem by doing that? And I had them contemplate that for a long time. And finally, they came to the conclusion that doing these types of ceremonies changes behavior. And changing behavior is what we need to be able to sustain ourselves in this, in this environment, especially right now, this, this looming uh, threat of, of climate change uh, at different levels of our, of our, of our lives. We need to be able to approach this with this connection, with this relationship, and this is how you build that relationship. And the one last thing that I'll, I'll leave with you uh, 
as you begin to think about these things, is think about the earth for a second. The earth itself is almost 25,000 miles in circumference. Okay? The earth is 8,000 miles in diameter. Yet the habitable, livable atmosphere that we need to survive is only three miles thick. If you think about that for a minute, three miles. There are some mountain ranges that extend higher than three miles on the surface of the earth. If you think of, uh, of uh, uh, Mount Everest or Mount McKinley, they extend up into what the mountain climbers call the death zone. And the reason why they call it that is because the oxygen does not support human life at that height. So 25,000 miles, 8,000 miles, three miles thick, our atmosphere. I used to teach my students, and what I would do, I would take an apple, I would cut it in half, and I would show them that here is the earth, okay? And the, and the red skin around the apple is the habitable uh, atmosphere of the Earth. And in fact, that might even be an over-exaggeration. The atmosphere may even, that ratio may even be uh, a lot wider. It could be even thinner than that. But I tried to teach my students about, you know, we have a very small space that we can live in. And if you look out into space, there's no other place we can go. So I also try to promote that too, about how fragile and how small and how sacred this space is where we have to live and thrive and raise our kids, our grandkids, for the next seven generations. So we have to start doing something and we have to start doing it quick. So I want to say, miigwech bizindawayeg oma nongom. Thank you for listening to me tonight. Uh -huh. I guess, you know, there's going to be some, if you guys have any questions, we've got a couple microphones up here if you want to come down and, uh, and ask. And I know that we also have uh, people that are on Zoom uh, may also be uh, uh, chime in as well, so please feel free to come down if you have a question or a comment. Yeah, thank you, thank you Michael, um, so much for this today. There is a question that came in um, via Zoom here. I'll read it. I'll read the comment and then the question. <coughs> First, it's, it's gratitude. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate the integration of language and the message of humility. I am wondering how you interface with policymakers when your position is one of, we are the least of creation, while often policy is focused on humans first. Actually, the first word that came to my mind is sasakwe. If any of you know Ojibwe language, that means a war hoop. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, in order to address some of these uh, uh, battles, we have to make our, our voices known. We have to bring our issues to the forefront knowing that we may get the door slammed in our face as Anishinaabe people, but we have to keep going back. And the one thing that I have learned from the native people, from the Anishinaabe people in northern Wisconsin, when I reflect back on their, the wars that they had back in the late 80s and early 90s with, with, the, with the spear fishing, man, they fought vehemently to, for their, tri, their treaty rights and the fight for uh, their right to, to fish the spearfish for Uga, the walleye. And I read about them years ago when I was in grad school, and I thought, oh my God, I hope one day I get a chance to live and work uh, with those people. And then sure enough, here I am. I've been working for Glyphwick now for two years. So um, approaching policy, I mean, we have a different worldview uh, than the rest of society. I'm not necessarily a warrior myself. I am a teacher. And I think my duty is to do just what I did tonight, is to educate and to share my knowledge with what I know uh, with the rest of the world in the hopes that maybe 
that we can come to some type of cons consensus in order to preserve you know, our ecosystem and our livelihood. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another comment, and I think a question also for your, your thoughts on this. Um, do you have suggestions for how we can, as individuals, um, how we can bend society in a gentle direction, like birds flying in a flock? What was the reference? One of the, this, this framework that I mentioned, um, building relationships, identifying, you have respect for this being, but really understand it in depthly. So respect, um, um, the next one is reciprocity. You know, what do I give to these species and what they give back to me? And then the overall question is responsibility. What do I give? Uh, what is my duty to help protect uh, these species in these changing times? So yeah, I guess I would suggest going back to those, uh, those four uh, uh, key points in this, in this framework to think that out. So a question, a question I have, um, mm -hmm. and I've struggled with this when thinking about climate change and talking to other people about climate change, or some would say the climate emergency, um, is the negative effects it's having on people, our plants, the swimmers, the flyers, the, the, the four-legged, is happening now, and the limited resources there are to address the emergencies happening right now, but also the need to, um, or the desire to want to stop um, emission to you know to address the what is causing some of these uh, challenges um, at its source but not knowing how to focus my energy on both or not feeling I have the capacity uh, either as an individual or as an organization to address both I'm curious how your framework or your thoughts on this have um, how, how to navigate the need to address emergencies now that are emerging and affecting people, um, how to adapt versus how to mitigate the causes. Have you thought about this? And do you feel kind of the framework that, or other thoughts you have can guide us or provide some perspective on how to navigate adaption versus mitigation? Mm -hmm. I think this framework that I uh, presented is probably on more of an individual level. Um, but I think human beings collectively, I mean, we've got the power to be able to change policy in, in, this, in this society. And we do that through changing the distribution of money, you know, getting out there and voting. Uh, these are things where we can actually make big uh, political changes if we could just get together. But we are so divided, we are, we are so divided right now and I mean, not only at a mental level, but at an emotional level. I mean, just this thing that happened a couple nights ago at the, at, the, at the Academy Awards divided the entire country. Now we're all fighting each other now over what happened you know, on the stage at the Oscars. We were already divided uh, uh, politically uh, from the last administration. So how we come together, I mean, I honestly, I don't want to sound gloomy, but I think it's going to take a catastrophe to bring us all together, to wake us up and realize that we have to work together. Uh, otherwise, um, we're going to have a very different world to hand to our children and our grandchildren. But I believe that if we could ally together, uh, change the way money flows in this country together, vote politically together, I believe these will make huge impacts, I believe as we approach this, uh, this 2050 climate prediction. I hope that answered your question. Other comments and coming through here of you um, that I want to share. Uh, this is from Valerie. Much gratitude. Such beautiful words and teachings shared here tonight. Miigwech for opening up the invitation for us virtually. Miigwech, Michael, for your wisdom, strength, 
in humility. I'm your Gretchen Valerie. This is from Linda. The Anishinaabe perspective is to be admired and spread wisely and loudly. I believe that we need to hear even more from indigenous people and show more respect for you and thereby for the earth. Your presentation has been so moving. Thank you so much. Nahal miigwech. I've got, I've got quite a few questions, but I think okay. the, the simpler one and, and most easy one to articulate is just, it, it seems like when we talk about climate change and the problems there, we use a lot of melancholic and, and uh, catastrophic language, as we should. Um, but have you found any hope in, in your education and in your queries? About any positive? Right. Yeah, actually, uh, I did come across um, a lot of those prediction models from 2007, the research that was done, actually said that the maple trees, the sugar maple trees, were actually going to expand in northern Minnesota. Uh, the maple biome was actually going to spread north and west, you know. So for people that depend upon maple sugar, that was actually, that's, that's good. You know, I mean, there's already avid uh, sugar harvesters up in that region going all the way over to White Earth. You know, White Earth is kind of on the western boundary of the maple sugar biome. And then the northern biome, I think, kind of goes close to the Canadian border. But because of the increased precipitation that's predicted in that region, uh, those biomes are going to expand. So that's actually a good thing. Yeah. And I've always got my ears out. You're right, the gloom and doom really gets a lot of, of uh, uh, fanfare. Um, climate emergency, climate crisis, we all feel like we need to do something. Um, I do have this philosophy that thinks that nature can heal itself if we would just take the pressures off of it. We, we don't have to fix anything. Nature can fix herself. We just need to quit adding the, the sickness and the impact. You know, so, and that's, I don't see too much science which talks about nature's way of, of sustaining. It's always about hum, how humans are going to create sustainability. So we definitely need to humble ourselves, that's for sure. But thank you. You had another question, huh? Okay. I'm, I'm very interested in, in philosophy, and, and one thing that I find particularly interesting is uh, indigenous stories and how that, I suppose, just how that affects you, how that affects the people around you. Um, is, is that something that you have to take faith in? How does that, how does that impact your worldview? Stories? <clears throat> yeah, the story I shared with you about the cedar tree just had a, a transformative effect on my life, made me a different person, a different thinker. And I like to talk about that story, about how these stories and these words can, him, can have transformative effects. There's one word I want to share with you uh, along those same lines. And um, it's a word that we, it's a hunting term. Nitage. Nitage. And what that means is to go out and kill something for food. Uh, a hunter going out killing food for his family. Nitage. But at the same time, that word netage also means to mourn the death of a loved one. Okay, so when you take those two things, hunting and killing for food, mourn the death of a loved one, all in the same small word, netage, that changes your whole perspective about what hunting should be. And we don't go out and kill for sport, and we don't go out and kill uh, indiscriminately we've got a purpose when we go out and hunt and then we're supposed to be humble and mournful when we kill something to feed our family and that's all right there in that little word nitage that's another one of the beautiful things I found about the language is, is there's all of these subtle teachings within within the smallest word and I'll spend the rest of my life you know finding these words and researching them and teaching them 
And this, this is kind of, I think, where my path is, has brought me to. Uh, yeah. Naho, miigwech. Um, a, a couple more comments here. Um, and, or a comment and a couple questions. Um, first is from Kat. Chi miigwech, Michael, for sharing this important knowledge and Ojibwe Moan with all of us who are relatives. Naho, miigwech, Kat. Um, I have a question from Monica. How do you care for your own mental health as you look into the future of our climate crisis? Kind of building on these earlier questions. How do I look? How Take care of my own uh, mental your, health. Your, your own mental health, your own mental well-being. That's a good question. I, uh, I think taking time to do these ceremonies, which, which kind, of, kind of reinforce these relationships that I have with the natural world, I think is good for me. Um, Reflecting on these stories also is good for me as well. You know, it, it, it fortifies my teachings you know, about, about how I should behave and act with the natural world. And also, too, one of the most healing things that I've done for myself is to learn my mother's language, the Anishinaabe language. It, I can't tell you how much healing that's brought to me to be able to speak. I'm not a fluent speaker. I hope to be before I pass on. But the one thing that I am doing that I am teaching uh, to, my, uh, to my students and to my colleagues at, at Glyphwick, um, this, is, this is kind of a sacred journey for me. This is not just a, a job. It's given me a lot of healing and, and, and a lot of peace by learning how to pronounce these words and knowing how to carry on just a simple conversation in Anishinaabe Moen. Yeah, and for that, I'm grateful for the language. And this is also kind of gift. It's a gift to my mother, too, who had her language taken away from her. And so I'm giving this back to her and making sure her grandson knows how to speak the language, too. No. This, this question is from Sarah. Why is tobacco always given for appreciation? The tobacco comes from our teachings. Uh, a sema, that's how we say it in, uh, in, in our teachings. And um, tobacco is one of our four medicines. Uh, we use it to, uh, to heal ourselves. We use it to build relationships with other people. We use it to build relationships with things like wild rice or raspberries. We always go out and sprinkle tobacco and uh, give that. There's been times that I've known when people did not have tobacco on them and they looked and scrambled, and all of a sudden they found like a candy bar, a Butterfinger. And so what they would do is they'd take the Butterfinger. Like, well, I don't have tobacco, I don't have a, a sema, but I'm gonna offer that to the spirits, and I'm gonna humble myself before I take. So, it's not always a deal breaker if you don't have any tobacco on you, a sema, but uh, uh, people, spiritual people that have practiced way know uh, they know how to kind of get around those those complications. So, I feel, I feel like uh, that's something that I, I need to keep in mind. Thank you for offering that. Mm -hmm. um, this is we're, we're getting some more. We'll probably a few more here and then uh, wrap it up if that's all right with you. That's fine. Um, thank you for sharing this framework. Uh, I feel an urge to share your message of the four R's with others, but would like to ask permission first and then how you would be comfortable sharing this with respect and honor for your work. Do you have thoughts on this? <clears throat> yes, uh, that person has permission to, to share it. I am planning to write this down into an article or, or some way. Uh, I'm developing it right now. Right now I'm talking about it. I'm trying to get it deeper and deeper into my head, uh, getting more and more articulate uh, with these concepts. And I'm hoping to culminate that into a, into a writing or a, you know, some kind of a, a curriculum, maybe. But right now, it's just, this is kind of new, and it's kind of in its growth stage right now. And I'm hoping it'll be a gift to everyone soon. But, yeah, she has, a, she has permission to, to use it. An another question. Um, the message of ceremonies seems important. For those of us who are not familiar with that, or have no experience with it, do you have suggestions how we can become engaged in ceremonies towards healing and responding to climate change? Uh, 
Well, I have two answers to that. One, I, I would strongly encourage maybe uh, to go out and seek a spiritual advisor. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a native person, but somebody who has a spiritual connection uh, with nature. And there are many world religions or world cultures that have that. And also, too, I would just suggest to reflect on it. And you know, like I said, sometimes going out and taking your kids out on a walk and not just taking it on a, well, a pastime, like I, we don't have anything else to do, we're going for a walk, but actually be very deliberate about taking your kids out to the woods and making sure that they learn something before they come back. That could turn into a ceremony as well. And then once you establish that, then just to repeat that over and over again. And your kids will remember it. You know, you'll remember it. So those are, those are the two recommendations I guess I have. Uh, another comment here. Miigwech Michael. My old teacher, Mukha Aman, used to ask me, what are you going to do when the lights go out? I think he was advising me to learn more traditional methods of sustaining my family. Thank you all at Gwiflik for helping and supporting that too. Oh, miigwech. And this question could maybe give us a, a space to, to pause our conversation for the night. Um, how can we contact you if we have questions about all the wisdom you shared with us tonight? What is a good way to follow up on this work and build community? Yeah, if you just Google me at uh, uh, Glyphwick uh, headquarters, their website, glyphwick.org, and you can find my name and, and email there. Yeah, pretty easy to find. I'm probably on Facebook more than I should be, so that, that's another place to find me as well. I'll offer, um, as we, people who registered via Zoom and are attending via Zoom, we'll send a follow-up email with uh, um, some information about this recording, including your, including your uh, uh, report. And we're, we'll have this recording available uh, mm -hmm. through in coordination with Glyphlik, up and available shortly, too. So, um, miigwech, Michael. Nahal, miigwech. Yeah.